Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. fashionable in the late 1800s for any Parisian to lay claim to a rich American uncle. But the fact was that the French Impressionist painter Edgar Degas had one. Michel Munson, Degas uncle, was not only wealthy but well known as head of the New Orleans Cotton Exchange. Degas himself was already somewhat of a celebrity when he arrived in New Orleans in 1870 to visit the Munsons. His relatives were excited to have the famous artist from Paris residing in their home on Esplanade Avenue and even persuaded him to paint their portraits. As with most Impressionists of the day, such as Renoir and Monet, his canvases reflected modern life. One famous Degas painting, Portraits in an Office, the New Orleans Cotton Exchange became a classic, the first work by an Impressionist ever purchased by a museum. The art world had finally recognized the Impressionist movement. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to Esplanade Ridge in the Degas House. Built by architect Benjamin Rodriguez, the Degas house dates back to the early 1850s. The original mansion was literally cut in half sometimes around 1920, producing two separate buildings. Edgar Degas opened the eyes of many to experience a unique depiction of American modern life through his paintings. His most famous work, Portraits in an Office, the New Orleans Cotton Exchange, brought the attention of the art world to this talented artist and marked the beginning of his impressionistic career. Degas' sister-in-law, Estelle, was a confidant and friend during his brief stay in the Crescent City from 1872 to 1873. During this time, Degas painted several portraits of Estelle, prints of which can be seen in the hallway and main parlor of this historical mansion. The works exemplify his fondness for her, and the original portraits can be found in museums around the world today. This bed and breakfast allowed guests to share in the Degas legacy in one of three suites located on the second floor and even Degas' original bedroom found on the third floor. From elegant to intimate, each room has a character and charm of its own. Features such as Degas prints, 14-foot ceilings, period furnishings, and private balconies enhance each of the accommodations. Special attention was paid by preservationists in choosing colors and furnishings for each of the suites. Y'all, check out the detail in this little writing desk. And go ahead, take a look at this lady's vanity. What a nice little piece. Owner David Villarubia's renovation was a labor of love for a man who's known by his friends as Loving Rough Gems. Transforming Degas' bedroom located on the third floor became a real test of David's patience because you see the architects had to install the staircase twice in order to meet the rigid historical guidelines. What a test of his sanity. Y'all, visiting this home offers guests an opportunity to not only experience Degas' important legacy in New Orleans, but to enjoy one of the most unique evenings away from home. 
Y'all, I can only imagine the excitement in the city of New Orleans when people learned that Degas had arrived in the city. And I was driving down Esplanade Ridge just the other day in my little black Thunderbird, and I got to thinking about Degas getting, walking out of the house with his canvases and his easel and onto that old harsh-driven streetcar that ran down Esplanade all the way to the Cotton Exchange. And I can just see people looking over at that seat saying, my God, is that him or what? And today we have an opportunity to spend the night in the house that Degas lived in for the year that he was in the city, 1872 to 1873. I tell you, that has to be fantastic to, to all of you out there who love and appreciate art. And the Munson family was uh, such a big name in the city of New Orleans, not only did they have that great mansion, can you imagine a man of, of uh, that wealth, so, so well known all over the United States uh, uh, in the day, can you imagine the parties he must have thrown, Mardi Gras parties at that house? Well, one of the dishes that I'm going to prepare for you today is a dish that I'm sure was served at one of those elegant Mardi Gras parties at the Munson Mansion, today called the Degas House on Esplanade Ridge. Let's take a look at my platter right here. I want to show you a couple of the... Uh, ingredients for this very simple soup that we call the queen soup, of course, after the queen of carnival, the queen of Mardi Gras. Here's some breast of chicken and just, uh, uh, and you can use dark meat as well as white meat, but I like to use white meat in my chicken soups because this is a cream-based soup. And one of the main ingredients, wild rice. Now, when you look at, at wild rice, first of all, you should know that it's not really a rice. It's a, it's a wild plant and the original colonists kind of thought it looked like rice, so they named that uh, wild, but wild rice, but this was one of the dishes that the Native American Indians were harvesting around the Great Lakes, and it eventually found its way down to New Orleans. Here is a blend that most of you see today, the white rice as well as the wild rice, and this is brown rice. For all of you people who love brown rice, there's even a good mixture available today of brown and wild, and this, of course, is the wild rice that's already poached. It takes a little longer to cook wild rice. It takes about, oh, I guess, uh, 30 to 45 minutes poaching. I like to cook it in a little chicken stock. So let me show you exactly how we do the queen soup that Mr. Munson served at that Mardi Gras party. First in my cast iron pot, I'm going to put a little bit buttery flavored oil. Let me kick that flame way up here on my, on my pot. And what I want to do is to start a good saute of vegetables in the city of New Orleans, of course, being so heavily influenced by the Creole uh, uh, style of cuisine, we always like to marry uh, a full array of vegetables, a little onion, celery, bell pepper, all of those nice flavors into our pot. Put a little bit onion, celery, bell pepper in there. And this is going to start to saute in the pot fairly quickly. And once this uh, starts to saute, we want to wilt these vegetables. We want to get a nice, uh, uh, a, a nice transparent look to it because we want to pull the sugar out of the vegetables. And while that's uh, uh, sauteing, I want to show you my stock pot here, y'all, because this stock pot is a nice, rich chicken stock. In fact, let me dip down in here and show you some of the ingredients. Look at that chicken chicken neck, all of the giblets, uh, onions, carrots, and this, of course, is the bones of the uh, chicken uh, that I've deboned here. Now, I have to poach my chicken for this uh, particular soup, so I'm going to take two of my little breasts and I'm going to put them down right into that 190 degree liquid here, y'all. I don't want to, I don't want to boil this uh, chicken breast. I want to just let it sit down and uh, in that water. You see how white it's getting right away? That's because that water is at about 190 degrees and it's going to poach that chicken in just a couple of minutes and that's the stock and the chicken that I'm going to use to create this nice soup. Okay, y'all, the uh, uh, vegetables are sauteed nicely here. I'm going to add a little touch of garlic to it, just a nice spoon or so. I love garlic, and I'm sure Mr. Munson did too, and certainly Degas, after all, he was French. He had to love garlic. So we're going to saute that around. I wish you could smell that garlic when it hits that nice buttery flavored oil. And now I need to thicken this just a little, so I'm going to put in a touch of flour. This is a white roux. I said it's a cream-based soup. Now remember, not too much flour, y'all, because the rice becomes the thickening agent in this soup. And if you put too much uh, flour, you're going to have a mess on you. You're going to have a rice pudding here instead of a rice soup. Okay, down into this uh, uh, nice roux with the transparent vegetables, now I'm going to add a touch of my chicken stock. Let me get my 
poached chicken out of here. Of course, I have some already done. So let me go ahead and uh, get some of that nice stock out of here. Always put a little basket in here. That way you, you're going to keep from getting all of these uh, onions and celery and all of that because we already have some fresh ones in here. You don't want the ones coming out of the stock pot. Put about four or five nice ladles, y'all, of the rich chicken stock right down into the soup. Look at that cast iron pot, how nice that simmers away. And then I'll blend that around for just a second. Look how nice that is. And what we have here is a velouté, y'all, a nice uh, stock that's thickened with a blonde roux. And you can see how light that is. Now, to finish it, I would add whatever uh, herbs and spices uh, you normally like. I'm going to add a little sage because this is chicken. A little sage, a little thyme, a little basil. Just go ahead and throw all of that into the soup, just like that. And then I'm going to throw my chicken into it and wild rice. Now you can put your wild rice in already cooked or you can take the wild rice and mix it 50-50 with the wild rice blend right down into this. And remember it's going to take 30 minutes uh, to cook. So assuming that this has been cooking now for about 30 minutes, let's go ahead and finish it with a little touch of heavy whipping cream. That's right, good heavy whipping cream, y'all. I'm going to put a little touch of it down in there. And the finished poached chicken, and it's already cubed. I want to show you that. Look how nice that is, all cubed. And imagine now if that white rice and wild rice had been cooking a full 30 minutes in here, this soup would be totally thickened to a nice creamy consistency as it is over here in my, uh, in my terrine. And I want to show you exactly what that terrine looks like. Let me this out of the way. Take a look inside of this at my queen soup, y'all. Get a good shot of that chicken and rice. Take a look at that. Isn't that nice? It's just absolutely beautiful. And an elegant, elegant presentation for an otherwise simple chicken and rice soup. Can you imagine how simple that is? Just chicken and rice, but yet all of those wonderful flavors coming together with a rich chicken stock. Beautiful and fitting of a party that Degas would have attended. Now my next dish, y'all, again, a very elegant dish, but using simple, uh, simple ingredients. And I want you to take a look at my platter here. This, of course, is uh, uh, artichokes, and this is going to be a fricassee of uh, veal, ham, and artichokes. And you can see all of the ingredients here. This is the globe artichoke, and of course, the most popular artichoke that you find in the store today. It's great for stuffing. And we've taken some and peeled them down to the bottoms because this is going to actually be the receptacle uh, for the veal. So let me show you exactly how we do this. This is kind of a stir-fried uh, uh, dish, y'all. You just want to kind of put a little bit buttery flavored oil down into the saute pan. Not a whole lot, but just enough to kind of coat the bottom of the pan nicely. And you can see how, uh, how quick that's going to heat up. Now I'm going to saute or stir fry, as I said, the veal. Now, you know, veal, when we talk about veal, we talk about a young calf that you can see how nice and pink that meat is. Uh, normally, you talk about a calf that's uh, about five or six months old. But today in America, there's such a movement against uh, baby veal that normally we talk about a young calf that's about a year old that's not necessarily grass fed. Uh, anymore, all grain fed, but yet it's a nice tender, the most tender of all meats, and then of course very nice light and white. So you can imagine how fast this is going to cook and lean too. So once the veal is sautéed for a second, now I'm going to add some beautiful smoky sugar cured ham. Y'all just think of the flavors here. Baby white veal and then ham going down into the uh, dish as well. The ham's already cooked. So needless to say, you don't have to worry about uh, cooking this for too long. So once all of that's uh, in and cooked, and, I've, and this, of course, has to braise for just a little while, what I'm going to add uh, to it now, of course, is some more of our great seasonings. And use as much or as little as you would like. I like to put onions, celery, and bell pepper, but I'm going to use the colored bell peppers in here. I'm going to throw in some pretty yellow uh, orange, red, all those beautiful peppers because, again, this is a sauce that's going to go into artichoke bottoms. So stir that around really, really nice. And, of course, for seasoning, I like people to season uh, the way you like your food. I don't like to tell you a teaspoon of salt or a teaspoon of pepper. Season to your own liking. I'm going to put a little touch of salt, a little touch of pepper right down into it. 
And then I'm going to move it off to the side because I have to thicken this. And I'm going to thicken it, y'all, with a dark brown roux. This is equal parts of oil and flour. You see how nice and mahogany color that is? That is a beautiful roux that I made by cooking equal parts of oil and flour and then uh, letting it cook to that golden brown. And it has that wonderful nutty flavor to it. And I'll mash that around right into the bottom of my skillet because that will become the thickening agent for this great, great sauce. Now, a little Marsala wine, just a touch of Marsala wine into the dish. Very simply done. And beef stock. We get a little beef stock in here because this is what finishes the sauce of the dish. And I'll just put enough in there to kind of get this nice and thick. You can imagine that the veal is already done for all of you people who like your veal medium rare. It's already done, and I would just let this simmer for a couple of minutes for that sauce to thicken nicely, and then I would season it again with some nice fresh herbs, whatever herbs, again, that you like, the ones that I particularly like for this, would again be thyme and basil because that is so much the, uh, uh, the flavors of early Creole New Orleans. Uh, all of the different cultures love basil and thyme. And then, of course, when I, uh, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to go ahead and plate this up for you so you can get a look at what it looks like. But y'all, uh, while I was at the Degas house, I was lucky enough to meet my good friend Mike Roussel, who's the executive chef of Brennan's, and he and I went into the parlor and cooked Crepes Estelle, named after that beautiful Estelle of Degas house. Take a look. Hey, Mike, thanks so much for meeting me here at the Degas House. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. You know, Mike, we're going to do a crepe dish today that's not only named after one of the girls in that painting right there, but those girls are standing in the actual room that we're in today. So the perfect dish, right? Let's do it. <laughs> OK, good. I have the crepes. You have the sauce. I have the sauce. Throw a little zest in there. So this is Satsuma zest right into that's it. That looks like a lot of butter, huh? Yeah, but that's for six, and uh, we're going to reduce it down and make it only for two. Okay, and then a little bit. Sugar. Sugar, about well, a couple tablespoons, right? Yes. All right, perfect dish for Louisiana, too. Excellent. Sugar and, and the zest of citrus, because that's we have it. a lot of citrus here. Now, of course, this is the... the juice. Satsuma juice, huh? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, we could use any citrus. I'm using satsumas, but... You can use orange, lemon, lime. It depends on what you feel like eating that day. And if it's the summertime, you can go with the lime. It'll give you a nice, refreshing taste. And the aroma, too, coming out of that saute pan. It's going to be all over the house in a few minutes. <laughs> all right. Now, what about the liqueurs? Uh, you can pour them in. Okay. This a is grenadine. a little bit grenadine right here. Okay. And this triple is sack. triple sec. Now, oh, boy, I tell you what, this mm -hmm. will get you excited That's in this it. room, huh? And, and then a little bit of the fruit. This That's is satsuma. It's just some sections in there. And you just want to cook them down enough to make them tender. You now, now make... Mike, what makes the perfect crepe in your opinion? Well, I think a perfect crepe is a crepe with, with what I call lace. You know, like if you let the batter marinate overnight, and then when you make the crepe, it's lace. You can see through it. You know, just like, so, so it's very thin, it's light, very thin and, and light. Now, the final little touch here is cherry brandy. Kushwasa, and right? And we're going to let that just simmer for a second and thicken nicely, and it becomes just the perfect sauce. No, no need to thicken it or starch it or nothing else. Nothing else, and uh, we're going to put it over the crepe instead of put the crepe in here. You can do it either way. Oh, good. But I think it's excellent to do it All right. this way, you know. Okay, why don't we go ahead and ladle that nice sauce bar. The aroma is incredible. Go ahead and throw that on there. A couple of little spoons of that juice. And I'm going to go ahead and garnish it for you here. There you go. Grab that plate right. for me there, Mike. You take that spoon. And now I'm going to garnish it with a little bit whipped cream naturally, just a little bit. Just a little bit. On top. And of course, you want to put a little mint or some pretty flour. And we could even come back in with a little powdered sugar. Sure. Make an uh, excellent dish. What a tribute to Estelle. Why don't we go over and eat a couple of these? Now, Mike, not only are the crepes Estelle delicious, we're serving them on this beautiful Degas china. Ah, oh, what a magnificent crepe dish. And don't worry, y'all, we will sit down and eat it in just a second. But take a look at our fricassee of veal and ham here. Isn't that just beautiful? A nice light sauce. And I'm putting a little bit of this 
Nice, so a little chives. Now, of course, I want you to think about this as a breakfast dish as well. Put this on top of a nice, crusty French bread that you toast in the oven with a little butter on it, and serve this as a breakfast dish right on top of that, uh, uh, on top of the French bread. It's absolutely magnificent, y'all. A great, great dish. Of course, it can be served over rice or potatoes as well. Now, a couple other great dishes that I've discovered over at Dega Foods of Early New Orleans. Let's take a look at it real fast. The first one that I want to show you is the bouche. Chinois, the black mouth it's called in French. This is a wonderful chocolate cake and it's made with chocolate and the chocolate is melted with a little bit sugar and bourbon whiskey oh, and a little touch of flour, not too much flour in this and it's baked at 375 degrees in a spring form pan for about an hour y'all. It's magnificent. Bouche Noir, black mouth. And look at this, potato souffle. This is actually whipped potato clouds, and the, the whipped potatoes are then mixed with egg yolk, cream, and egg white, and just put together, baked at 375 degrees until they rise right out of the pan. Now, y'all, I told you we were going to eat our crepes of stale, and Mike Crusell was good enough not only to join me at the dining room table, but to sit down as executive chef of Brennan's and talk to us a little bit about what it's like to head the kitchen of one of the most important restaurants in all of the United States. Not only is he a great friend, he's a fantastic chef. Let's hear what he had to say about Brennan's restaurant. Man, these crepes are fantastic. Mike, don't you have crepes on your menu at Brennan? Yeah, we have the crepefish yarrow, which run a rival to uh, the banana faucet. Oh, gee, bananas faucet. That's one of the most famous dishes in America coming out of uh, your restaurant. Now, you've been employed as uh, executive chef at Brennan's for about 25 years, but you've been there for 40. What's it like to be a part of an institution? Well, what happens is it's like part of being part of the family. And, uh, you know, I just enjoy what I'm doing, and the Brennan's step in when we have to put something together, but 90% of the time I run the show. Well, you know, I can't help but think about the fantastic responsibility that must be being under a microscope as the executive chef of one of the most famous restaurants in the world. Well, it's a lot of pressure, John, but when you leave the kitchen and go out and speak to the diners, it's a different world altogether. Make yeah. it all worthwhile. Yeah, I bet it is. You know, the Degas House is located in an area of New Orleans called Esplanade Ridge, and at one time, this was definitely the homes of the... Uh, uh, the, the great of New Orleans, the streetcar line ran right in front of this house, but you also visited here quite often as a young boy. Yeah, my wife and I got married two blocks away at St. Rose de Lima, and she lived on uh, Esplanade and uh, Bayou St. John, and we walked this street up many a day as going downtown. <laughs> Getting the shades of those great oaks out here. 417 Royal Street, the address of Brennan's, it's only about 25 blocks away. You know, I can only imagine the number of stars, the rich and famous that's been through those doors. Who are some of the uh, people you've met there? Well, just about all international and national uh, politicians, uh, all types of movie stars. A couple that come to mind is Virginia Lair, John Wayne, uh, Charles de Gaulle, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, just a few just of a few, uh, people know. stopping by. <laughs> yeah, just stopping by as you pass. Uh, Mike, I think of uh, everybody having seen the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, but a lot more people have had breakfast at Brennan's. But that restaurant started on a dare, didn't it? It was a dare between uh, Owen Brennan and Count Arnold. And what it was, Count Arnold didn't think that an Irishman could open a restaurant. <laughs> so Owen had to prove it to him, and that's where Brennan's evolved. So, so, so he said that, uh, uh, that an Irishman couldn't cook a hamburger. That so was that, about it. A, a great, great story. Now, but then at some point in time, he converted it into a famous breakfast place. How did that happen? Well, when the book came out, dinner at Antoine's, well, Owen conceived the idea, well, why not breakfast at Brennan's? And that's how Breakfast at Brennan started. And boy, I'll tell you, what a marketing concept, because I think everybody around the globe has certainly heard of Breakfast at Brennan's. Now, I consider Brennan's to be probably the finest breakfast spot on the globe, but uh, New Orleans as a city is really the home of breakfast as an event. Yeah, well, you have so many places in the city that you can get breakfast around the clock. You know, you have uh, Tally Ho, you have um, Coffee Des Moines, a lot of the other places around town 
that you can get coffee and brunches. All your restaurants is having breakfast brunches. Like uh, like Commanders, Commanders Palace, and uh, yeah, sure, Quarter Two Quarter Sisters, two sisters uh, Antoine's, yeah. On Arts. Mike, thanks a million for stopping by and visiting with me at the Degas House, and I'm going to see you at Brennan soon. And thank all of you for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Let's try these crepes out here, Mike. Yeah, this tastes pretty good, huh? Now, do you, what, what does your crepe look like? Do you have a filling in it? To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folsom Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Foltz is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zataran's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zataran's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.